I'm Margaret Mueller. I'm the president and CEO of the Executives Club. On to our program for today. Before we get started, please enjoy a message from today's sponsor, Northwestern Medicine. Your heart is failing. Four words no one ever wants to hear. I'm Mike, and this is my team at Northwestern Medicine. My nurses, my cardiologist, my cardiac surgeon, and my pulmonologist. Yes, heart and lungs, because blood clots in my lungs were causing my heart to fail. Anchored by the number one hospital in Illinois for nine straight years, only Northwestern Medicine had the solution to save Mike. A breakthrough treatment that reached the remote clots deep in the lungs that surgery couldn't. Tiny balloons were used to gently open the delicate vessels, restoring blood flow. Not long ago, there was no solution, but Northwestern Memorial Hospital was the first hospital in Illinois to perform this life-saving procedure. My team saved my lungs to save my heart. Now, we're both breathing easier. Northwestern Medicine. What makes us better, makes you better. Thank you, and I want to thank all of our sponsors who made today's program possible. We have our presenting sponsor, J.P. Morgan Chase, our gold sponsor, Northwestern Medicine, and our silver sponsors, PwC, Sidley, and ZS Associates. So over the past 26 years, the Executives Club of Chicago Board of Directors has honored one individual with the International Executive of the Year Award. Since its inception, the award has gone to a global CEO whose exemplary leadership has created a significant contribution to their company culture and to the global business community at large. We have recognized many outstanding global leaders over the years, including our esteemed moderator, Paul Pullman, with this prestigious honor. And it is my privilege to add Juan R. Luciano, Chairman of the Board of Directors, President and Chief Executive Officer, Archer Daniels Midland, to this list. Juan joined ADM back in 2011 as Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer and was named President in 2014. In 2015, he became Chief Executive Officer and then Chairman of the Board in 2016. Under Mr. Luciano's leadership, ADM has revolutionized the global nutrition business, focusing on industry-leading ingredients and solutions, paving the way for brand new growth opportunities. He has led the company's mission to utilize innovative technologies to meet customer needs, expanded ADM's global footprint, and has leaned into internal talent and expertise to build an inclusive culture and drive the company to success. And now I'd like to introduce Curtis Reed Jr., Region Manager and Managing Director at J.P. Morgan Chase, who will say a few words and introduce our speakers. Over to you, Curtis. Thank you, Margaret. Good afternoon. My name is Curtis Reed, Region Manager and Managing Director of J.P. Morgan Chase, Chicago. I'm so happy to be with, here with you all today to celebrate this year's International Executive of the, of the Year recipient, Juan R. Luciano, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer of Archer Daniels Midland. J.P. Morgan Chase is a proud presenting sponsor of today's program and supporter of the Executive Club's platform that brings the diverse stories of world-renowned leaders to the business community here in Chicago. The Executive Club's mission is to provide business leaders opportunities to develop and nurture meaningful relationships while gaining world-class knowledge that will expand their perspectives and sharpen their capabilities. Today is a special day because not only will we hear from two esteemed speakers, but also have the opportunity to honor the renowned leadership of this year's recipient of the International Executive of the Year Award, Juan R. Luciano. JP Morgan and ADM share a strong and long-standing relationship across multiple products and geographies. Under Mr. Luciano's leadership, ADM has undergone a remarkable evolution, building on more than a century of heritage to create a global nutrition business with an industry-leading array of ingredients and solutions that are opening the door to growth opportunities in key global macro trend areas. He has spearheaded the increased use of innovative technologies to meet customers' needs and led a strategic growth campaign that has expanded ADM's global footprint, building capabilities and adding talent and expertise that allow it to create value at every part of the global value chain. I'm delighted that before Juan is presented with this year's award, he will sit down with Paul Pullman, 
chair and co-founder of Imagine, and a past recipient of this distinguished award to discuss Juan and his team's work at ADN, how the company has grown, where it's heading, and what some of the leadership lessons are that have paved a path for Juan to winning today's award. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Paul Pullman and our 2021 International Executive of the, Executive of the Year, Juan Luciano. Well, thank you, Curtis, and thank you, Margaret. It is an honor to be here. And let me start first and foremost by congratulating Juan. I could not think of someone who deserves it more than Juan. I've known uh, Juan for a long time already, uh, more than a decade. I'll go into that in a second. And uh, when the opportunity came to um, be part of the panel and, and have a discussion uh, together, I could not uh, refuse that. And uh, it's a real pleasure, Juan. And and nice to see you again. In, it looks like it's a home game uh, with Chicago. I had the honor, uh, as Margaret mentioned, to be recognized in 2015 and was there with my wife. And unfortunately, we have to do it on Zoom because what I remember is that the people in Chicago know how to throw a party. So <laughs> hopefully we uh, have an opportunity to celebrate in person uh, in the not too distant future. We're all looking forward to that. You know, I was thinking about this, um, uh, the word Juan uh, Luciano. Luciano is, uh, comes from the Latin Lucianus, which in turn comes from uh, Lucius, which actually means light. And I think we have here an incredible leader that is shining light on how business should be done, what responsible business looks like. Uh, it's someone who actually not only unlocks the, uh, or gives energy to people, but to a greater extent uh, unlocks the energy in people. And that is what I think makes ADM such a wonderful company with this great leader that you're currently recognizing. Juan and myself go back to the Dow years when I entered the board of Dow in Midland, Michigan. I could never understand why someone from Argentina would move to Midland, Michigan. But Dow, uh, at Dow, I got uh, to know Juan with, uh, when he was responsible for, if I remember, the uh, plastics and the agrochemicals and a wide range of other the divisions. And he, at that time, already was certainly tipped to be the a chair or CEO candidate for Dow. And he uh, led uh, one of those divisions as a president. But uh, it was a sad day for Dow when he left to take on this wonderful opportunity at ADM that we're going to talk about. Uh, besides a great businessman, He's also a great humanitarian and cares about uh, the world in a broader way than just uh, the influence that his company has. And we'll talk about that. The first thing perhaps to do, uh, Juan, if I may start with that, is to give the audience a little bit of an overview of uh, ADM. You became president there in 2014 and in 2015, fairly quickly after that, you only actually became the ninth chief executive in the 112 year history. Uh, tell us a little bit about ADM. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the Executive Club of Chicago and certainly the, the presenting sponsors and you for this honor. And uh, uh, again, when I look at the past recipients, I, I'm humbled to be in the company of all of you. And, and I think this is a clear, clear recognition that I'm getting old when you start getting these awards. You know? So I, I assign it to that. So. Um, Talking about ADM a little bit, ADM was founded uh, about 120 years ago, uh, so very close to where the Executives Club was founded. Um, and it was originally a linseed oil processor in the Midwest. Uh, today is one of the 50 oldest public companies in the New York Stock Exchange. I think we are like uh, 40 something. And the revenue of around uh, $65 billion. So uh, from that beginning as a linseed oil processor uh, in the Midwest, uh, the company quickly evolved into an international grain merchandising, uh, transportation company and processing of corn, wheat and oil seeds and other products around the world. And as you've been saying in the introduction, uh, we've been undergoing a transformation over the last few years in which we have gotten much closer to consumers through insights and research, and uh, which has allowed us to shape our offerings much better to the new consumers. And uh, we recently have evolved 
uh, um, our portfolio into a complete uh, range of ingredients and solutions for food and beverage, but also supplements um, and nutrition for pets and livestock. So today the company uh, emerges as a global leader in nutrition with roughly 800 facilities in more than 160 countries around the world. So I'm very glad to be working along these uh, 38,000 colleagues. They, um, they really uh, epitomized uh, professionalism and responsibility. You, we participate in the whole value chain and we feel that responsibility every day, not only with our consumers and feeding the world, but also uh, the sustainability uh, uh, responsibility that we have to preserve the ability to continue to feed consumers uh, as we get uh, crowded in this uh, small planet that we get. So. Yeah, Juan, Juan, you talk about an amazing thing, which is the 120 year history. And many companies are made to sell an average length of a publicly traded company in the US is 17 years. You've uh, been around for 120 years and getting stronger and stronger. Just uh, perhaps give the audience a little peek in, into what you think are the values and, and the culture that actually makes this company last so long. Yeah, I think that uh, um, when I joined ADM, uh, of course, you, you want to fit in the culture and you want to understand that culture. And this is a culture of... Uh, people that think maybe a little bit of Midwest mentality, much more about others than themselves. Uh, and, and I think that um, when you think so much about others, that responsibility wears on you. And we are a little bit internally paranoid, you know, about, you know, uh, making sure that we are ahead of our times and we continue to change or to match the rate of change outside the company with the rate of change inside the company. And we are fruit of small communities. And sometimes, you know, it's difficult to keep pace with the future when you are in a small community. So we make big efforts to be close to the communities, close to the customers, close to the farmers. And I think that uh, that, that keeps, you, uh, keeps you current, if you will. And uh, ADM has always been very innovative. So I shouldn't take much credit because the, the innovation bug was in ADM. Think about it. We talked so much about the veggie, veg, vegetable plant or plant-based burgers these days. ADM launched the veggie burger in 1982. Uh, so it's been 40 years in the making for us. ADM had the tilapia farming in the 90s in, in Decatur, Illinois. Um, everybody talks about carbon capture and sequestration. We have our first carbon capture and sequestration facility in 2017, way before all this range. I mean, we have sequestered already 3.5 million tons of CO2 safely uh, underground since uh, we have two facilities. So uh, I think the, this, uh, I'm just being uh, riding this wave of people that were always connected. And what happened is the consumer changed the way they were thinking about food. The consumer thought for a long time about food in the three components in convenience, flavor, or, or taste, and price, if you will. And uh, over the last 10 years, we have seen that transformation in which consumers are more, much more thinking about uh, the experience of food, how food expresses their values, how food uh, become a, a component of feeling better, overall feeling better, not only physically, but also emotionally. And with that, they have asked about different things. And with that, we have to evolve to keep current with the consumer. So, uh, so I'm very proud of the way the company have, have been following up, following through the consumer changes. Well, the way you express it, Juan, it sounds to me that this is a long-term multi-stakeholder model with purpose at its core, close to the communities, close to the uh, customers, if you want to, or consumers. And also, obviously, the last thing that you mentioned was a very innovative throughout its history. I wanted to come back to your comment on close to the farmers and lift a little bit the curtain for the audience on what it was, what the, the young Juan was like when he grew up in in a farm in Ramallo, Buenos Aires. It's like a little bit of a homecoming from the farm there to uh, ADM. 
and continuing your uh, connections with the farm community. Tell us a little bit about your use. I believe the, the farm is still in the family, you told me once. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, um, paraphrasing the famous uh, philosopher, uh, Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset, uh, I am I and my circumstances, if you will. So, so to a certain degree, what you are come from yourself, but your circumstances and my circumstances, of course, I, are the family and the country where I grew up. So in my family, on my father's side, everybody has been a lawyer for many generations. So I come from a generation of lawyers. And on my mother's side is a generation of um, farmers and people that own elevators and things like that. So they were in the commercial farming environment. So that's the environment in which I grew up. Uh, to the disappointment of both sides, I went to engineering school. <laughs> you know, I, I always did well academically. And at that point in time, it was like, if you do well, you go to science. So I study engineering. So I'm, I have a master's degree in uh, industrial engineering. Right. And, and, um, in Buenos Aires. In Buenos Aires, yes. And, yeah. I, and I grew up in a family that um, it was... Um, very much insisting in education. Education was very important. And the standards were pretty high. I, I always tell the story, and uh, I hope my mother is not listening, but uh, my father passed away when I was a kid, when I was six. So my, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, grandparents came to uh, live with us. And one night uh, in a dinner, we were talking about how did it go today in school? You know, school was important, was our role. So. Uh, I was saying, well, I got the nine in, I don't know, math. So nine in Argentina, the rate out of 10. So nine was pretty good. And uh, my mother leaned on me and she said, well, what happened? <laughs> so the expectation was, you know, nine is not 10. So what happened this time? So, uh, so it was uh, always that. So we were surrounded by books and I was into either education or, or, or sports. And, and that was my, my youth. So I have great memories of that. And, and, uh, uh, and that marked a lot of what I did. And, and through my career, if you will, if I have to see um, my drivers, if you will, will always to learn and to make a contribution. And, and you, you told uh, the story about Dao. Um, I spent 25 fantastic years about Dao. It's, it's, a, it's a top notch company, which I will always be grateful for the, the time and the effort that they invested in developing it. Uh, somebody coming from Argentina, very unlikely uh, to end up in the corporate world in, in Midland, Michigan. And, and uh, and they, they did a terrific uh, job. And, and, and as I said, I'm, you know, and to be honest, I, my, I was minding my own business and never thinking of leaving that when I was approached one day by a headhunter. And um, I have to say, I, I said no four times to ADM. So that was uh, how difficult it was to change, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. No, I know it was, a, I remember the sad day in Dao when you left and we've always stayed in contact, but uh, Dao lost a great leader and ABM gained one. You're very modest because it, the, uh, you didn't tell them that the Buenos Aires Institute of Technology, I know from our own company and when I recruited for Unilever as CEO, it's probably the best engineering school in the whole of Latin America. At, uh, yeah. It was an incredible quality. So. Congratulations on that. You know, when you said, Juan, my father's side were the lawyers and my mother's side were the farmers, I couldn't help goes through my mind as uh, which side is more pleasant for you in the US, the lawyers or the farmers? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly the lawyers in Argentina, uh, Argentina has a different remuneration system for lawyers in which you don't get the percentage of maybe the claim or something. So the, the, the lawyers are more uh, providing a, a civil service, if you will, and versus just, uh, you know, sometimes these uh, lawsuit mindset that we find in the US. So uh, I, I, I was, um, it's, it's a different experience, if you will. The, the, the farmers, the farmers is, is uh, it has been a, a fantastic story. Listen, I, one day I was in my, in the office in Buenos Aires of ADM. And uh, they said, let me introduce you to a farmer. And, you know, the farmers sometimes are in our offices reading the newspapers or catching up with, you know, with 
the prices and and, and uh, risk management strategies and whether they should sell or hold the grain and all that. So we have a, a very fraternal discussions with farmers. And these farmers have done business with the, my families, uh, my, my grandparents, and 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 uh, and they are and my great grand uncles, I guess. So it, it was interesting that um, very small world. And, and so I, I felt from the beginning very comfortable in the presence of farmers. Uh, as I said at the onset, my, we lived in, in, with our grandparents, with our maternal grandparents and my mother and my brother. And so every night, uh, we were talking about the weather, you know, that that's what you talk when you are farming, you know, we're always complaining about the weather is never perfect, you know, yeah. uh, so, or, or if the weather is perfect, then prices are not good. So you, you're always complaining. So I live with yeah. that. So mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with what worries a farmer. Of course, mm -hmm. nowadays, and you know, Paul very well, you, you always been my inspiration in this. Uh, what worries the farmer is also, and worries all of us, is the sustainability of what we need to do, and and doing it a better way, and doing it more sustainable ways for that land to be preserved, the quality of that land. I think it doesn't escape uh, people, and that's what I'm so excited about it, being in ADM and so passionate that we need to do as a humanity two things that we never done before simultaneously. One is to feed 50, uh, 9 billion people by 2050. We never done that before. Second is we need to do it as at the same time we turn the clock back in carbon, in carbon usage. And those are two things that require everybody's effort. And, and we at ADM, we feel that we are at the center of that. And, and you see it even in our purpose. I mean, we rephrase our purpose during my tenure and, and we went to this purpose, which is unlocking the power of nature to enrich the quality of life is to make sure that we understand from the first sentence in our, in our purpose that unlocking the power of nature, which means preserving that nature to be able to continue to unlock and respecting that starts with, with everything we do. And, um, and I think that we feel that responsibility of being in the middle of making this transformation. Yeah, no, it's well said. And and I know from the work that we're doing, Juan, that you're a key a leader in moving the whole market to a regenerative agriculture. I think a hallmark of a leader is not only um, focusing on his own company, but actually or her own company, but expanding these boundaries so that you can continue to grow. When half the rainforest have disappeared in the world and we're dealing with things like uh, the COVID crisis as a direct result of our destruction of nature, I think more businesses understand the power of creating these sustainable business models, which also, may I say, was very much into the culture of Dow before you came, which really leads me to another question that you perhaps could share with us is before you became CEO, which is a totally different job. And I felt at least it's very difficult to prepare for that when you're being thrown into that job. But what were some of the lessons you learned in your 25 year career before that, or 26 year career that you thought were probably the most useful ones for the current uh, responsibilities that you have? Yeah, th th uh, that's a very good question. The first one was, um, uh, again, I, I have a master in engineering. So, and, and my first, job out of school was actually programming computers. So I'm, I'm a very introvert person. I'm a shy person, more analytic person than social person. And lo and behold, Dow hires me as a commercial person, as a seller. <laughs> I was uh, the worst person, the worst personality to be a seller, if you will. But it was an incredible school to me because in Argentina, uh, this is uh, uh, at that time, at least, all the companies, all my customers were um, not large corporations. So I will deal directly with the owner. And that was an incredible MBA education, if you will, for me, because I could think, I could see live how an owner thinks about the business. So uh, it, it, it imparted in me knowledge that I didn't have coming from an engineer in the school. I was a pure engineer. So that was fantastic. I spent five years in, in the field with customers and, and I became, uh, and I understood then what was sales all about. Sales was to reach that level in which they trusted me. 
they trusted me to do the best thing for them. And in order to do that, I needed to understand what their corporate priorities were. Not the priorities as expressed by a purchasing agent, the priorities as expressed by the owner of the company. That's what it was. So I learned a lot about that. And I think that uh, my wife always said, you never left out in 25 years because every time you were getting comfortable, they gave you a new challenge. And as I said, learning drives me. Yeah. And uh, so, so I spend a lot of time, but what I realized more important probably is that uh, the most important learning during these years were learning about myself. Most of the other things uh, I couldn't control or do anything about it if I couldn't, know how to deal with myself and you know i'm not an easy guy to deal with <laughs> speaking from myself <laughs> from the inside of myself so th that was the important thing I, I i you know i and i learned also to be honest and 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 have an, a clear assessment of myself i'm not the soul of a party i'm not so I, I i i couldn't spend a lot of time with customers i mean people take energy away sometimes from me so it's tiring for me and and so at one point in time i needed to pass in a promotion to become a commercial director and i stayed in being a business leader because i thought that even immediately i had a promotion opportunity I thought it was more who I was to be more an analytic person, more a person deciding on, on strategies. And, and as I got older, I became more interested in people, but people more about helping them achieve. You know, I, I realized that they were spending more awake time with us than with their own families. So I felt that responsibility to say, to make sure that I help those people spend that time away from their families, which is so dear to them wisely. And it's things that matter, not only for the short term, but as a legacy for society and for themselves to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that where I landed now that I spend more time talking about how to make sure my people or my company creates an environment that allows people to become their best, whatever their best, the definition of their best is. But my responsibility is to create that environment where they, you know, they are allowed to be themselves and to be their best. Yeah. And then put together a strategy so that we are sustainable, so we can continue for another hundred years. I don't want to be the one that, that stopped that great track, track record of 120 years being alive and thrive for the company. Yeah, no, these are great uh, lessons. And I think we all um, can relate to that uh, a level of uh, continuous learning yourself and, and curiosity, which is uh, you mentioned about knowing yourself, uh, your strengths and weaknesses, so that you can complement them. You talked about uh, helping others uh, be a real servant leader, which I know you are. Uh, real leadership starts if you put yourself to the service of others and knowing that by doing so, you're better off yourself as well. And then you understand the values of working on the forest versus in the forest, enabling others to do their jobs and, and provide the uh, frameworks and environment to do that. Now, if you take the flip side of that, uh, Juan, when, uh, when you became CEO, uh, an incredible job of incredible responsibility, what were some of the challenges that, that you had to deal with? That you said, oh, I wish I would have known this before uh, before I got into this job. Undoubtedly, you have some of those to share. Oh, many, yeah. Uh, I think over time, uh, when I reflect back, Paul, uh, I agree with you. I think that, I, you know, I, I never actually wanted to be the CEO. I, mean, I, I, I didn't shy away from it, but it was not my drive. It was not obsessing to that. So, um, but what I get, but, I thought I was ready to be CEO. And as you said, then you realize you, you're probably not. Uh, because it it's much more uh, an emotional issue than an intellectual challenge. I mean, it's more about having the stamina or having to deal with all the things that happen to you. And a lot of things are not what you were prepared for. You are prepared for running a business to define a strategy to allocate resources. And, you know, yeah, a percentage of a CEO is that, but it's not the largest percentage. The largest percentage is dealing with culture. And, 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 
and shaping the culture and making sure that also uh, you control yourself because at times, uh, unfortunately, but uh, your uh, behaviors or your, or your, or your uh, uh, feelings that day uh, spread in the corporation. One day you didn't sleep very well and you come serious and everybody thinks that the company is in trouble. So, so to a certain degree, you need to put yourself aside and making sure that you embody the corporation. And that is a little strange because you come from one day not having that role and but the next day you have that role, you are the same person, but yet the impact on you changes significantly. And, and that you need to leave that. And as I said, I'm not, I'm a shy person, so it, it, it took me a while to acknowledge that responsibility. But, you know, I understood it very quickly, the power of the, of the position on something very silly, but I may, take, I may take a second to give this story. So I was in ADM already for three years, and I was the president and COO. So you could argue relative, I mean, high importance from my role perspective. And I'm a tea drinker, you know? And every time I go to a conference room to, in, in ADM, I will go into a meeting, I will go to the coffee table, and there was never tea, you know? <laughs> so I always need to go out and procure my own tea to get into. So the moment I became CEO, I have the same meeting in the same room, I go to the table, and they say, what are you looking for, Juan? And I said, well, I was looking for tea, but don't worry, there's no tea, so I drink water. The next meeting, there was a wooden box with 36 different flavors of tea. <laughs> My point is, I've been- Lipton, I hope. Uh, they, they were yeah British teeth yeah but but I was my, my point I don't know if Unilever I don't remember but hopefully you won't but the point is three years I've been there and nobody cared about that and all of a sudden the following day it became important that tea was available so but that gives an impression of uh, that that may, was a realization it was an impact to me so I I needed some time to mentally promote myself if you will to that position that what I said matters. And I also learned by mistakes uh, to not to speak too soon. At times, you know, uh, in a meeting, uh, you know, in, in, you get into uh, the, your desire to get things done and you know data and you have a lot of business experience. And sometimes I lean on an answer too quickly. And that, of course, when you say something as the CEO, that becomes a direction immediately. And that, you know, to a certain degree, silence the debate, if you will, and you may not hear other people's position because you have already made the decision. So that transition from being one, from being one on the table to being the CEO, you still consider yourself one at the table, but your voice kind of summarized the conclusion. And I, 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 I made that mistake at the beginning. I, I, I tried to be a little bit better now. Not completely there. I'm still work in progress. But yeah, no, I think, we all, I think we all did, Juan. And this is, you, you're, you're so kind to be so honest. But you're talking about people. You're talking about culture. You've talked about the shadow of, of a leader, which is a very important part. And then I think the most important thing, which I like about you, is I always say a good leader is first and foremost a good human being. My father always used to say he also passed on way too early, a little bit older than yours, but way too early. And uh, he always said in Dutch to me, never forget your, your number of the house you came from and just keep your feet on the ground. And yet so many people get carried away with the private planes and the bag carriers and the ones that uh, bow in front of them and, and just say yes, yes to everything that it starts to take on a different life and you have this perpetual capacity to stay human. So I wanna thank you for that. If, if, you. if you could do one thing different after, you, you know, everybody talks about the first 100 days. We see that now as the president in the United States, you get a million articles. In your first 100 days at ADM, was that one thing that you now say, oh, I would have done this differently if I could? Yeah, I think that, uh, um... I never want to give up on people, yeah. And but sometimes my mistakes on people have been hanging to some people in certain positions for too long. And um, as we look at my EC now, uh, it has a combination of heritage ADM and 
and uh, people from the outside. And I think I wanted, and maybe this is, this was professional pride or stupidity or whatever. I, I wanted to show in ADM that I didn't need to bring a lot of leaders from the outside at the beginning for ADM to become better. And, uh, and, and it became better to a certain degree. We just couldn't get to the next level with all people from the inside. And, uh, and, and I, I hung to some people for a little bit too long, if I have to say. Uh, and, uh, and, and people that were fantastic people. Uh, uh, but I, to a certain degree, I confused uh, loyalty to the company and absolute love for the company with sometimes the technical expertise we needed for a company of 60 billion, 65 billion dollars in these complex times. And, you know, somebody once said that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And sometimes when you grow up in Decatur and you've been in Decatur for 25, 30 years, uh, you know, there was a very telling way in which a lot of ADMers introduced themselves, which is, uh, hello, I'm Juan Luciano. I've been with ADM for 30 years. And yes, yeah, sometimes that is good. If, if over 30 years, like in my case in Dow, they give me, uh, I, I spent 25 years in Dow and they gave me probably 10 experiences of 10, two and a half years. But you could have also 25 years of experience learning something one year and repeating it 25 times <laughs> and sometimes that's what happened with some of our leaders in which they have a great knowledge of ADM and great passion but they were using 1972 knowledge if you will for right. a world that was changing too far and and so if I have to do some uh, something all over again I, I probably need to I will do a, a deeper assessment of the talent I have vis-a-vis -vis the things that I needed versus just vis-a-vis -vis the, their love for the company or their knowledge of the industry. Yeah, yeah. No, I think we have all gone through those learnings, uh, Juan, and, and probably still do. And it's not easy to be a CEO, though, because, uh, or, or in a senior position, when you have the, the, the size of the chains is, is like the industrial revolution and the speed of the chains is like the technological revolution. You need to continuously reinvent yourself. And... Now yeah. we have COVID, we have the uh, planetary boundaries issues to deal with, the technology coming in. It's not easy to be in the senior levels in the company. So I don't, uh, don't envy you. But you've been an architect actually of the broader transformation of ADM, which I had the pleasure to observe from the outside where you actually transformed it from a, what I might call a traditional agricultural business, if I may, to actually a leader in, in nutrition and uh, a human and animal nutrition, if you want to, and uh, getting into things like you mentioned in the beginning, the alternative proteins, the microbiome uh, solutions, and, and many of the other things that position you well for the health and wellness space of the future. How difficult was that transition? And what are the type of things that you had to do to position yourself well? Yeah. It was much difficult than, than, than it sounds. The, the company now makes more than half a billion dollars in profit from that division that didn't exist five years ago. So it's, it's a significant uh, part. And of course, now everybody sees it with clarity. <laughs> we, we started this in 2012. It was not that popular at the time. Yeah. And you know, Paul, I think that... Uh, in order for a company of our size, again, 60 something billion dollars to actually turn, uh, it's a little bit like a boat, you know, you don't turn the wheel of the boat one, five degrees for the boat to turn. You need to turn in many, many times for the board to store. So I needed to be a little bit of a maniac of nutrition and almost talking about nutrition nonstop, even to the detriment of what maybe other parts of the company will feel about myself because they felt like, okay, you are a nutrition person, but that's what it takes for you to get, first of all, to get internal protection to some of the new leaders, leaders that were receiving a disproportionate amount of the resources. Because of course, the strategy is not the allocation of resources based on what you have been, 
you know, is on where you're going. But of course, it's difficult to do internally when the commodity side is making all the money and you take all the resources and you give it to, a, to the nutrition side that is very small. So, so it, it takes a lot of that. And, and, uh, but, but, you know, to, to, the credit, to the credit of the leaders in ADM, they saw that very quickly because the consumers were moving that. And, and I do believe, I have, I have a belief, Paul, in, first of all, that everybody deserves access to nutrition. That's why I like our coverage and I extend to every country in the world. But the second is that I do believe that the nutrition, the right nutrition has the power to actually improve some conditions. And if you think about the world that is getting older, over the next five years, the population in the world over 65 will be bigger than the population under five years old for the first time in history. So we're getting older. And then you get this burden on the health healthcare system of five things that are cancer, um, mental issues like Alzheimer or dementia, uh, pain, but then you have heart disease and diabetes. And I don't know if we can do anything for the other ones, but uh, heart disease and diabetes are metabolic syndromes. And I do believe that through the proper nutrition, we can contribute a lot to, to bridge the gap between food and pharmaceuticals. And before you get to need pharmaceuticals, before you need to get to treatment, you can correct yourself. So we have been investing heavily, not only in plant-based foods and, 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 and vitamins and things like that, but we invested heavily in the microbiome and the ability to understand why if you and I share the same meal, you lose weight and I gain weight. Why if you and I share in the same medicine, it puts you to sleep and it wakes me up or things like that, because it's all about the trillions of cells that we have among ourselves that react differently. So now we are, you know, one of the technical leaders in, in probiotics where we have clinical trials that we can prove the efficiency, the efficacy of those products in helping with some conditions, whether it's atopic dermatitis, male sterility, obesity, sleeping disorder. So, so I'm very proud of ADM coming, as I said, not just to feed the world, and we have aligned the company, Paul, our guiding principles, not only our purpose, but these three trends. One is feeding the world, that responsibility we still carry. Second is this health and well-being. And the third one is sustainability. Everything we do is look through these three lenses. It has to match one of those three lenses for us to be working on that. Yeah. And they're all closely related, obviously, and they reinforce Absolutely. each other. I was lucky at Unilever before I left. We did 65 acquisitions, but I bought uh, the MVS Minerals, Vitamins, and Supplements, the Oli business, and subsequently the company has bought some more. But that's definitely positioning yourself well for the future. You also made another important point, Juan, which I took notice of is how difficult it is sometimes, you know, Christiansen called it the innovator's dilemma to allocate uh, resources on where the future potential is instead of keeping feeding your, your, your current uh, machine that delivers. And that's a fine balance where you have to be able to do both, but certainly not starve the future. And I have to compliment you. You seem to at least... Uh, the way you're explaining it, have, have found that balance. So if you build on what you're saying, Juan, and the uh, the three mega trends that you shared with us, what would you say for you should be the ADN 10 years out, if you could describe that? Yeah, uh, we, were, we were doing this a lot last week as we were talking about the world portfolio. And uh, we know we're going to have, and I don't know if a division or what, but we are spending a lot of time in climate solutions, Paul. And uh, we are talking a lot about sustainable aviation fuels. We are talking a lot about carbon capture and sequestration and how to do more of that. We are talking a lot about uh, supplements for ruminants to reduce their methane production. We are talking a lot about, uh, we have, you will like this, we have 13 million acres today 
in sustainable agricultural practices higher uh, you know uh, agreed around the world with farmers again we have three and a half million tons of carbon sequestered we have alternative proteins but we also plant-based proteins but we also have microbial technologies where basically we are making uh, we are working with companies that can make uh, food or protein out of air uh, we are we are working in in a, in a collaboration with a company Innovafeed that will collocate an uh, insect uh, plant next to our facility so we can feed insects to animals. So so my point is, uh, yeah, we're still going to be buying wheat, corn, and soybeans from the farmer and transforming that, but uh, but we have a significant. Um, different perspective and, and it's the wonderful thing of running ADM you go from in the morning talking about uh, regenerative agriculture agreement with the farmer to in the afternoon checking the clinical trials of the new probiotic that we were about to launch in B2C business that we actually have so uh, it's an incredible range and uh, uh, as long as we can handle that complexity you know we, we will be doing our purpose yeah so talking about that purpose, Juan, which is uh, clearly embedded not only inside of yourself, you're one of these courageous leaders that works with the heart and the head, and you're certainly living that. But um, although you're nowhere near uh, an end of a tenure, you always have to think about your succession, and we are not uh, um, mortals. Uh, we are mortals. We're not there forever. And um, what would you like your legacy uh, to be and, and how do you ensure that this strong sense that has been there for 120 years, this purpose that you've put smack in the middle again of, of the company, that that lives on even after uh, you hand over to the next great leader? Yeah, I, I think that the most important legacy will be uh, if we can acknowledge ourselves or be, uh, be a learning organization. Uh, because to be honest, uh, if you are focusing on learning, you are keeping current with the time. So you, you can assure yourself that you're looking forward, but also because there is so much to learn and things change so quickly, uh, a focus on learning keeps you humble, keep you knowing that you don't know enough. And that's important because as you said it before, the worst disease of a CEO, is thinking that you are somebody that you have achieved, that you have reached, that you are the person that the organization works for you, and uh, nothing, nothing more, uh, more absurd than that. But it gets into their heads of the people, and uh, and I think to me, that's the when we talk succession with the board, that's the main characteristic: is what is the kind of person we're going to pick. Everything else, you know yeah you can you can complement yourself you know you may be less financial oriented oh you can get a great cfo to complement you you can be less of an innovator okay you can get a great chief technology offer to complement you if you don't have integrity if you are arrogant and all that there's nothing that can protect that culture from you destroying it yeah. and i always tell my people it's never what competitors will do to us is what we will do to ourselves. If one day we cease to exist, is because we internally mess up, not because something externally messed that up. It will no. be us. No. Hey, Juan, the time is going too fast. I really enjoy it. We could be talking for another two hours because I'm you're sure. a fascinating leader. And, but it also reminds me that it's really time that we meet in person again and give each other a real hug. I think we all are looking forward to that, getting looking out of forward to it. But I also hope that the audience can realize this from this wonderful conversation that I had the pressure and privilege of having with you, that the, um, the Executive Club of Chicago has picked a, a worthy winner that is Thank truly you. a business leader by excellence. So I'll hand it over to Margaret again. And uh, thanks, Juan, for the opportunity. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for doing this.
I know. Thank you, Paul. I was going to say the same thing, that it's not surprising to anyone listening why Juan is this year's award winner. Thank you for this conversation. And so, Juan, we are thrilled to present this award to you today. There you are with it. We couldn't do this in person, but you do have it. Uh, and honor your many successes and remarkable leadership. Thank you for taking time out of your family vacation to be with us today. So generous of you. We look forward to seeing you live and in person in Chicago one day soon. Please join me all in a virtual round of applause. <laughs> and thank you all for being here today. I wish you well. Have a wonderful week. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. See you all soon. <laughs>